Well, good ap afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, attending the China and Hollywood panel. My name is Jonathan Karp. I'm executive director of Asia Society Southern California, and we're doing this uh, panel in partnership with the LA World Affairs Council. So we thank LA World Affairs Council for putting on this event and this particular panel. I'd like to thank my panelists. We have a, have a, a great group for you. We have a couple of academics and we have a filmmaker and they all have experience in China and in Hollywood. At the far end, Ying Ju, who is a professor of media studies at the City College of New the City University of New York, sorry, and the author of several books. And I'll shamelessly pitch it, Two Billion Eyes. It's on sale right next door, and I bet Ying will actually sign it for you as well. We have David Lee, who is an executive and a filmmaker who's done many things at different companies and now runs his own company called Leading Media. And the focus of that, one of the main focuses of that um, is distributing Western films in China and giving production services to films that are being shot in China and elsewhere. And Ann Kokos, who is normally at the University of Virginia, but this year is a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC and another author of Hollywood Made in China. This is out this year, and it's all about the relationship. Um, Ying, I will add, has written several books, and this, this one, Two Billion Eyes, is on television, but of course it's all the same idea. Anyway, I'm really happy to be uh, uh, talking about this subject. It's something that Asia Society also cares deeply about. We have a, a big conference in about six weeks called the US-China Film Summit, and it was created at a time eight years ago when the relationship wasn't much of anything, really, and people didn't know how to talk to each other, who to talk to. There were fewer options for collaborations or any kind of Western production with Chinese. Uh, participation, and so you know, we feel like we've helped start the dialogue, and and now we have a completely different world, uh, where it's a major, it's it, it you know it intersects with art, it intersects with trade, it intersects with economics, it intersects with uh, technology increasingly, and you know something else we'll be talking about today, it intersects with diplomacy. So this is more than just a small entertainment relationship. It's really about much broader relationships between the peoples and the countries. And uh, it's gone through some ups and downs as the general US-China relationship has. But uh, you know, a year ago, there was such optimism, lots of big major Chinese investments in Hollywood, talk of China taking over Hollywood and other exchanges happening. But, it's quite different now um, in the economic uh, sense, in the investment sense. Some of the biggest investors are being barred from, uh, from the US by, by the Chinese themselves. So I'd just like to open with a question to each of you to give, give, me, give us your take on the health or lack of, of the relationship between Hollywood and China at the moment. And if we could start with you, Ying. Um. Yeah, it seems as you know, it's it's very different, but actually, it's not as different. Uh, I wanted to kind of uh, very just briefly. Um, I'm actually working on a book that traces back a really a century long of relationship with the ups and downs of Sino-Hollywood relationship. And what I discovered the takeaway is and that you know, it's actually not that different. You know, a lot of things you're you're seeing now, the kind of love and hate relationship, you know, the constant. Uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 negotiation and policy intervention and so on and so forth, uh, and and it, it's you know it's the basically repeated same pattern that happened during China's Republican era from 1912 uh, to 1949. Um, uh, so you see a lot of the pattern, the same kind of pattern. What well, but the, the one thing that's different, the difference, the only difference is really the power dynamic has changed. Now China is in a much uh, a better, a stronger position to negotiate. And China is ready to flex its muscle, to claim market share, to also try to exert cultural influence. I think that is basically, you know, the kind of difference. Um, I feel the, the business dynamics uh, may have changed or, you know, last year we talked about so much investment and financing coming in from China. This year, uh, that seemed to have slowed down. 
Um, but as someone who's competitive and you know, we have a production company, we're competing with other uh, participants, I, I actually welcome uh, the, the, the normalizing of business kind of conditions. Because I think a lot of, a lot of that initial euphoria of, you know, let's go to China, was uh, either Western companies trying to access a piece of that, 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 that profitability, that growth, right? Or is Chinese company really not entirely familiar with how to make money in movies, but uh, participating in some type of capital stock play? So, you know, that type of infusion of capital, it was really disrupting the industry. Um, and I, I kind of, I personally welcome this slowdown because now people who've been in this business for 10, 20 years can actually try to make some legitimate business opportunities come true and make regular you know, profits that you should be entitled to based off of movies, which is very difficult. So um, one of the things that I think is the most interesting about the transition of the industry is actually how the Sino-US film relationship has become part of a much broader landscape of Sino-US of Sino-US relations. So it's no longer just that there are isolated producers who are interested in going to China and isolated producers who are interested in coming from China to Hollywood, but this is actually kind of being framed as part of a larger national security discussion about um, about Chinese influence within within the United States um, and. This is as the movie industry becomes more technologically driven. This becomes a, a really interesting, a really interesting world to look at, where we see AI and VR and gaming start to have broader applications outside of entertainment. So Chinese acquisitions of those companies be, take on a much different, um, take on a much different perspective when we're looking at them from the perspective of regulators in DC. Um, and also the Chinese government has started to take on a, a, different, a different vantage point. The other kind of key difference if we're looking rather than kind of larger structural issues, but a difference between this year and last year is the fact that we don't currently have a film quota um, so the film quota expired in February of 2017. It's currently under renegotiation. So there, that's actually a really big difference in terms of looking at what the rules of the game are right now. But maybe you can explain, they're being, it's being re renegotiated. Renegotiated, yes. But at the moment, it's still... It's still, oh, so at the moment, right. it's, still, it's still operational and still right. functional at, at its current level, but it's much different than having a, having a settled quota that is not being renegotiated right. under, but under there will, at present. There is a quota, and after the negotiations, there still will be yes. a quota, which is, of course, one of the you know one of the big constraints. I, I moderated this is actually a natural prog progression. This morning, I moderated a panel on trade and trade leadership, and uh, we didn't talk about entertainment, but of course, this is there are major trade barriers uh, for Hollywood that that they've Hollywood has been trying to figure out how to negotiate around. And David, since you operate and get Western films in China. Wh wh how do things stand beyond the beyond the studios who take up most of the quota? You're, you deal with a lot of independent movies or non-studio movies. What are the opportunities for for them? Last year, um, well, stepping taking a step back, we generally refer to the quota being 34 right. foreign films, uh, revenue sharing slots, uh, but in reality. Any given year, you probably have anywhere from 60 upwards of 80 foreign films released in China. So how do those movies get in? Uh, because they're Japanese films, they're Korean films, whatnot. So in reality, there's actually more than 34 films. Um, of those additional slots, um, some of them are Americans. Majority are not, since the American film get 34 of them. Um, last year, I think it was a record number of foreign films released in China. Uh, I think the total figure is something close to 100. And that was mainly because um, of the slowdown in box office growth last year. Uh, it's important that film industry continue to grow at a double digit rate, and last year's slowdown because the Chinese films didn't do as well. Um, so towards the end of the year, there was this floodgate opening of allowing foreign films to get into China and kind of drive and prop up the overall box office. I think this year, uh, as the figures I, I remember reading, this summer, China, I think it's about 16% ahead of the box office last year. So, you know, as a, compared to the US box office, China's actually going to have double digit growth, probably in the end, somewhere around 20%. Um, whether there, there will be another floodgate of foreign movies coming in you, is anybody's guess. Ying, did you want to say something on that or? You know, 
as, as David mentioned, you know, uh, in reality, there are more films coming in because a lot of films can actually bypass this quota, and the quota only applies to certain uh, productions. Uh, some co-productions can bypass the quota, which is why you have so many co-production deals going on. Uh, so that's the thing I, I kind of want to mention. Yeah. Okay. Can yeah, I add a quick? Yeah, absolutely, and you so, guys feel yeah. free to jump in. So just to give uh, another shameless plug for my book, uh, if you're interested in understanding what these different categories are and how different types of companies are able to get their films into China, there's actually a chapter that looks at the different at the taxonomy of different types of films that can be imported to China, co-productions, imp uh, revenue sharing imported films, um, as well as other categories uh, like production services agreements that David is uh, working heavily with. I wish your book existed when I went there 13 years ago. <laughs> well, you helped help, you help to write it. Me I mean, it would have. If it, without you, it wouldn't have happened. So, <laughs> let me also just ask another sort of big picture question. It's very obvious that Hollywood needs China. It's not as obvious to a lot of people in the business now how much China needs Hollywood. Uh, welcome your thoughts on whether you think they do. I think um, China needs Hollywood in terms of just supplying the films that you need to continue to drive this box office growth. Right? If if you were to reduce the number of foreign films released in China a year, um, I mean, right now it, it all kind of works out this way every year. Roughly 55% of the marketplace is Chinese films, 45% is uh, foreign films, mainly Hollywood, uh, and it's been like this for as long as I remember it. Um, if you were to remove Hollywood film from that, even though Chinese film will probably do probably better because you have less competition, but the overall annual box office won't maintain this double-digit growth. And that is a bigger problem that um, I, I don't think China can afford. I, I just would echo what David said. I mean, without Hollywood films, uh, really, and there, there's just not enough slot to fill. Uh, so the distributors, the theater owners are really in it for Hollywood films. Uh, and I wanted to remind people, you know, historically, uh, the reason Hollywood, you know, Hollywood was banned in China starting from 1950, right? All the way through 1994, right? You have a few decades, you actually literally do not have Hollywood films in China, except for the small scale films. So the reason why they reintroduced Hollywood films back in 1994 was because Chinese film production and film attendance was, you know, going through a slump. And so what do they do? They looked for Hollywood for a solution, and Hollywood came, and Hollywood literally, you know, really reinvigorated the Chinese film market. And, and you know, bringing up a theater attendance, I mean, really, the, the kind of a, a jump start, re-jump start for the uh, uh, Chinese film industry really owns a lot to Hollywood. And I think that looking at this, it's important to think not just about the question of actual films that are being distributed in theaters, but also Hollywood's ability to generate cross-platform IP. And if we look at the Shanghai Disney Resort, if we look at things like the Oriental Dream Center, uh, if we look at different merchandising deals and you know, ways, to, ways to drive economic growth, the, the Disney English schools, ways to drive economic growth that are not exclusively related to theatrical distribution. In, jar still in, in jargon, it's location-based Entertainment, right? Yeah, exactly. And, okay. and these are, I mean, these are really significant forms of forms of revenue generation that um, actually, by leveraging Hollywood IP, Hollywood studio IP, Chinese companies are, are benefiting from things like the owning uh, majority stake in the Shanghai Disney Resort. Right, I see that. But I guess I was also thinking um, of all those also being Hollywood needing China. That's the market. But yeah. China's obviously embarked on this very ambitious... Uh, game of building, rebuilding its own industry and searching for its own intellectual property and developing its own voice. Um, how important is Hollywood to that effort? So I think this is a I think this is a great question, and a lot of it depends on how what the Chinese industry is is framed. So when speaking with some Chinese film producers, there's this idea that the, you know, the local market is sufficient. And, and in, in many ways it is. I mean, the, the size and the, the volumes that are, that are possible to generate from a film that's being distributed primarily in, in, or exclusively in the Chinese market and is successful only in the Chinese market can, can, yield, can yield profitable films. But if you're trying to actually expand globally, um, I mean, Hollywood still has, has figured that out in a way that, that few other film industries have. Um, 
I, I think when Hollywood really has the, the Chinese film, and Chinese cinema, Chinese film industry have yet to really, uh, they really ambitiously want to have that is you know, Hollywood has the cachet, Hollywood has the name, that's the brand, right? And Hollywood films has this established popular appeal globally, readily, right? And Hollywood has the talent. And nowadays, of course, a lot of money actually comes from China. You know, the Chinese no longer need Hollywood to invest in their films, but rather, uh, the Chinese has the cash. They have a lot of cash. They can come in and they can buy up all the talents. That's what happened to uh, Wolf Warrior too. You know, they bought a lot of U.S. talents, get on board, and they, you know, this is a domestically made a film, but they have a lot of Hollywood talent imports. And the other thing is, you might uh, just uh, explain what Wolf Warrior Two is to people who don't know. <laughs> or I will. I mean, it's it's the highest grossing film in China. It's made over $800 million. It's a, it's a kind of a Rambo-type film um, that was Chinese but had, had some input from the Russo brothers and on the, also on the technical side. But it, it really, it was the second in a series and it, 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 it was a phenomenon that I don't think anyone really saw coming. All right, it was a huge blockbuster. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say, though, is it's interesting that, uh, and I kind of uh, shift the plot, topic a little bit and actually the the well kept you know little secret in china is uh the chinese audiences really prefer seeing an adulterated studio productions or just the chinese stories they don't like to see mixed things they don't like to see chinese elements to be enforced upon hollywood films right and so so that actually uh somehow uh, kind of uh, contributed to the success of a Wolf Warrior because it's just pure. It's, it's a Chinese production. It's not co-production, even though it utilizes Hollywood talents. But the story is a Chinese story. It's very, very patriotic. If you haven't seen it, uh, you, you should have fun. It's very patriotic. Uh, and uh, if we have time, I can say a lot about this film. But. Yeah, my, uh, David. I, I, I want to just add an additional point was that, you know, while we talked about China and eating Hollywood films, I think what China can really... Chinese film industry can really benefit is to learn how Hollywood became Hollywood, right? Hollywood took 100 years to develop. So over those 100 year period, you have different organizations competing with each other and then finally forming alliances, the MPA. How do we protect all of our interests while uh, new platforms are challenging the theatrical medium? How do we then bond together and say, how do we fight off the threat of television? How do we fight off the threat of DVD and VCR, uh, VHS tapes? And it, it's, it's that collective union of, of, of competitors who are all, say, we're all gonna play by the same rules. And then you have, similarly, you have unions and the filmmaker side, actors protecting everybody's interests. Over a hundred years of this refinement, you have Hollywood. And you kind of have a role for everybody. And even though China is growing and it's, 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 it's fascinating, we're all there because of this gold rush. Um, that infrastructure is, 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 is so young because it's only been around for less than 10 years as industry. So learning and, 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 and adapting what has got Hollywood to, to where it is now, that w I think is probably the most important for the Chinese film industry in its long-term interest. You know, you made an interesting point, Ying, that in, I mean, you've observed that Chinese moviegoers want either a Chinese story or a Western story. Yet one of the biggest initiatives right now <laughs> by Hollywood is local language films, and in, particularly in China. And so it's it's trying to find, you know, Chinese storytelling. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, are you optimistic that Hollywood, and this is for all of you, that, yeah. that Hollywood can produce a Chinese movie in China? Uh, Go ahead. It's, it's, it's been happening in the past... You know, over 10 years now, different studios have had uh, co-financing with Chinese filmmakers or producers, remaking some of their older movies or making movies about pandas and whatnot. And, uh, you know, some of these movies, uh, I made a splash. A lot of it just didn't. Um, so the whole remake business, I, I, think, I think it's a one way that a Hollywood studio can, can ha have bargaining chips on the table to participate. But you know, if, 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 if the underlying movie just doesn't translate or it's just not great as a, Holly, as a, as a local language remake, um, often and more often than not, they don't, they're not successful. 
I think it's important to think about the, the larger structural constraints of making films within China. So there are relationships with regulators that need to be attended to, which can, can constrain Hollywood, Hollywood studio creative processes, um, which is why films like Kung Fu Panda 3, you know, that, are, that were collabor that collaborative productions, are much easier to make as children's pro pro products than you know, other types of um, other types of entertainment for, for adults. So looking at this, and this is an issue that we see across a wide range of industries, um, like in tech as well as in media, um, this question of how to balance growth with, with regulatory constraints. And I think that this is something that Hollywood studios are still very much working on. And until that's resolved, it'll be very difficult to have. In terms of opening up? In terms of the, the, dealing effectively with, with regulators while making films that are financed by, by Hollywood studios right, in right. China. But uh, David, you have a library of how many hundreds of films? That 500. 500 that you've distributed or you're working on it in, in China. Well, what, what have you observed? Like, what has stood out? And is there, you know, there's, not a, there's no science to making a movie. Otherwise, uh, you know, Hollywood would have a great year every year. But what have you observed about Hollywood product that works? I think um, it, it, it's interesting to see the type of movies that work in China and sometimes don't work in the US, um, box office wise. Uh, and you, you figure, okay, maybe Chinese audience likes some of these movies that, according to American audience, box office wise, are not very good. Uh, but one thing we discover is, because we, we said, you know what? Why do Warcraft do really well in China and not so well here, right? Um, you know, why, why, why do these anomalies occur? Do Chinese people like these movies and, and, and vice versa? It doesn't work here. We, we went back, we looked at our 500 movie library, and we also looked at a lot of newer films that are released, and we actually compared the ratings on Rotten Tomatoes with uh, Douban in China and uh, IMDb and M-Time. What we discovered was the ratings are actually very similar. So creatively, if a movie's good, it works in both marketplaces. If a movie's not good, like, War I'm sorry, Warcraft, <laughs> rating-wise, both marketplaces didn't like it. But box office-wise, it did really well. So that's more perhaps related to the novelty of a big movie like Warcraft, because the movie's made for so much money that the Chinese uh, producers, you know, you won't be able to do that. And then nostalgia, the game, the game has worked really well. Uh, but in terms of creatively, actually, our tastes around the world, at least between China and the U.S., is very similar. You know, the uh, Warcraft is, is, is a special case because it's a, it's a real pre-sold commodity. It's, it you know, comes from a very popular game, and it, you know, a lot of Chinese really do play the game. It's playing so the popularity, it just literally took off. Um, adding to that just a little bit was that um, for films to really work in China, like the Wolf Warriors, I, a very important factor is for it to break down in the second and third tier cities. Um, uh, uh, films, like, like one of my favorite movies this summer was um, Baby Driver, right? And I was actually talking to um, distributors in China uh, within uh, the government, and we were talking about what movies work, what type of movies we should look to import, and we all agree that one of our favorite movies was Baby Driver. But the movie came out in, US, in China and it quickly disappeared. It did about, I think, 12, 13 million dollars, and that was about it. And we, we discussed it and we said the biggest reason was that, one of the biggest reasons was that it didn't cross over into second and third tier cities. You know, the sensibilities of those audience uh, as a novelty, they, they want to see big spectacles. You and, know. and just to be clear, those are the cities between like five and 10 million, um, right, uh, as opposed to our <laughs> third tier cities. But. Yeah. So, so that's, one, that's an, one observation we saw, that for it to really, really cross over, you, you, you need to have films that, that those audience can either relate to or just is palatable to them, you know. And, and just to add that, it goes back to what Jonathan asked, you know, does Hollywood, I mean, does China need Hollywood, right, the Chinese movement? I think uh, when you look at these, uh, these films, right, I mean, most, most of the many of the films that's universally really popular, has kind of universal appeal, cross-cultural appeal. They're not made from China. Uh, I, I don't see the rest of the world, you know, uh, the ego to embrace Chinese cinema, not yet. So I think a Chinese cinema has a long way to go. In many ways, they do need Hollywood to help them to build that. How? I mean, the, the equation has generally been finance, you know, capital in China and talent here, but not acting talent necessarily, but executive talent. Is that what you're referring to? Is that the talent that, that China needs? 
So some of the some of the interviews that I did um, have really focused have really kind of clarified the types of specific talent that are most useful for for making a film a Chinese film in globally appealing. So first of all, editing, um, effects, assistance with screenwriting. Though actually, like collaborative screenwriting tends to work better than um, a, than a direct translation. Um, so these questions of narrative pacing become become a huge issue. And I was a student at the Beijing Film Academy um, in the directing department, and that was really uh, it was a long time ago, but it was very instructive. Um, the types of films that we that we saw and that we learned from were primarily you know European European masters. The pacing was much slower. It was much less driven by this kind of box office box office pacing and the excitement of a lot of films that really drive box office growth. So even in the educational system, um, for people who are now in the in the process of of writing films and and directing them, there's still you know, a learning curve. Quickly, just so one of the things that's one of the, the major obstacles for the Chinese film industry really to take off globally, I think it really is, I mean, there's just really a real fundamental differences uh, between how the Chinese perceive the world and, you know, and, and America and the rest of the, most of the Western countries perceive the world. Right, and when you look at, let's just get back to Wolf Warrior Two, right? So it's popular, it's tremendously, it's a huge blockbuster in China. But did it make a lot of money in the U.S.? No, 2.3 million so far in the U.S. Why? But, but be, be, right. in fairness, it wasn't marketed. That's true. Much in the U.S. Yeah. But now, if they marketed it as a film that made 870 million dollars uh, in China, be, that yeah. might that might pique a little interest. But that's, that's a good point. You know, I mean, kind of for just, just finish up what I wanted to say here is, I think you know there is a. Um, so, um, how many of you have seen actually seen the, this film, Wolf Warrior? Okay, so you know, I mean, this is a, a story about this a Chinese superhero who came to a kind of nameless uh, uh, South African country, who you know just essentially, uh, this is a kind of replica of a rainbow except it's in China. So, so it's kind of a, it has this very strong jingoism cloaked in kind of uh, Chinese patriotism, and, and, and a kind of, uh, you know, the, the, this sort of a racist depiction of uh, Africans uh, as, uh, you know, nameless, witless, uh, you know, mass that's waiting for people to be rescued. So, so you have, I don't think the world is ready to uh, uh, really, uh, you know, see, uh, see the departure of white savior only to embrace you know, Chinese saviors. So I think it is a kind of <laughs> a fundamental cultural differences here that makes it difficult for some of the Chinese films, some of the uh, um, uh, themes that Chinese films want to come across to really appeal to, uh, to the West audiences. I, I think, you know, it's really not so much a China versus the US thing. I think it's Hollywood versus any local yeah. film industry, you know. So, you know, French film have a tough time crossing over around the world. Yeah. You know, the Spanish film, Italian films, even Canadian film, which is in English, Australian film. So it's not even a language issue, right? In terms of films that originate from certain countries, China is already number two in the world. So it's not as bleak as most people think. Three of the top five highest grossing foreign language movies in America are Chinese films. In fact, the number one film, Crouching Tiger, is more than double the you know, second film. Actually, a little bit less than double. 60 some million for Life is Beautiful. But you know, Chinese film have already crossed over in ways for over the past 20 years that no other film industry has crossed over. And mainly it's because Chinese filmmaking, Hollywood, Hong Kong filmmaking, I think created their own genre. They created the, the action martial arts genre, just like Korean created the K-pop genre. This is a new music genre on its own that can be competitive against all other music genres, right? So that, that's what China has done. Um, or Hong Kong, you know, since the Shaw Brother days, and um, yeah, I think that that's, that t that type of product still works around the world. Um, but in the same time, you know, you have that those martial arts elements now in adapted into superhero movies, right? If you watch Captain America, um, you know, all the action is just right out of a Jackie Chan type of Jet Li film now. So that's that's it's it's coming over in ways that well, uh, other than just those period martial arts movies that China can make that really nobody else really makes, and they make them as big spectacles. I think, you know, for it to really cross over, it has a lot of, a lot, a lot of challenge ahead. No, well, um, I want to open it up for questions, um, but let me just ask about Wolf Warriors. Let's stay on that for a moment, because that really kind of gets at, uh, you know, one of the 
quote unquote, I mean, accidentally gets at the strategic aim of projecting China in a certain way, of uh, demonstrating also this incredible financial strength of a product, and something that, in, given the right circumstances, could cross over and be popular other places, even if people just want to know what, what was so great about it. So let's talk about soft power right now, because when, when Xi Jinping made this declaration to invest in entertainment or media or whatever, this was a big, this was a, a, a big theme. And, you know, how does China see Hollywood versus its own now goal to project power through media? No, I think, I think this is a great question. And I, I think that the case of Wolf Warrior 2 is, is really fascinating because it came out the same, at the same time as the, the founding of the army. So we have a, a highly, so we have two Chinese military films with very different, with very different aims. The founding of the army being a, a film that talks about the historical development of China's army on the 90th anniversary of the founding of, of China's army. So it's this really kind of very, or 70th anniversary, sorry. Uh, it's this really kind of very momentous, uh, momentous political product, but Wolf Warrior 2 did much better. So we had, you know, during we had during uh, distribution during uh, press conferences for Wolf Warrior 2, the director actually encouraging people to go see the founding of the army. Um, so this really kind of highlights the ambivalence that we see in terms of the growth of the two the two mar the two different kind of parallel markets of still there there needing to be a, a kind of politically driven type of production and then a film like Wolf Warrior Two being much more commercially oriented. Now at the same time, Wolf Warrior Two is also in some ways the first film of the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, it, it shows, so China's Belt and Road Initiative is a major political and strategic initiative to connect the, both the, the, silk, the maritime Silk Road and the, and, um, and the larger um, relationships with Central Asia and Africa. And this, in many ways, expressed that visually. So it also did express these kind of soft power efforts. Actually, you know, you mentioned uh, you, you bring back the, the, uh, the funding of the army. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. This reminds me of uh, a kind of lengthy conversation I had with, uh, that was a year or two ago, uh, with the head of the China Film Bureau, who I think is now the deputy uh, minister of, uh, I need better get this thing right, uh, state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television. <laughs> It's soft, yes, it's, it's just a handful, but, but he was the one, essentially he's the one who was in charge of, you know, film planning there. And, and I remember I had this lengthy conversation with him uh, in his office, just asking him, you know, hey, this guy is very interesting. You know, he's actually a screenwriter. He was a screenwriter. He's a screenwriter turned uh, film bureaucrat, right? Uh, and, uh, and he's actually, you know, uh, given all these very militant talk about, you know, where Chinese film industry is booming, the business is booming, we're going to come and claim Hollywood, and we're going to build our own China. And this guy, when I talk to him, he's actually very modest. He doesn't in entertain this notion. And, but he's entrusted with, uh, you know, keeping a balance between uh, Chinese film, film industry uh, commercial impulse and also the mandatory cultural mission, right? So the soft power mission. So, so he's just kind of very softly telling me, you know, this is what we need to do. And he's trying to balance out uh, the political functions of film, economic functions of film, and being his, he himself as a screenwriter, he also wants to make sure he nurtures new talent. And he's the one who really green lights some films for Jia Zhang Ke. You all know who Jia Zhang Ke is. And it's interesting that the reason I, because during our conversation, the executive producer of of the founding of the army just walked in. He ambled into our office and he wanted to participate in, in some of the conversation. And he was actually a very seasoned producer. He, you know, he is not just making mainstream propaganda films. He has credits to many you know, uh, other uh, type of films. So you know, uh, the, the, the film is not necessarily, uh, I, I agree that it is being you know, cut casted as opposed to uh, the more grassroots uh, war foyer, but, uh, but they're not really kind of a, a, a opposed against each other. And, and, and the film bureau itself is also try very careful to, to strike a balance. That's why you have Wang Jing say, okay, why don't we go to see that film? Okay, very interesting. I'd like to open it up to questions. We will have microphone runners, and I'm just gonna go right in the middle. Um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about animation, and I don't know if there's a quota it would certainly seem that Frozen and Moana wouldn't be very threatening to the Chinese population. Is there a different quota for 
Disney's uh, animated films, and it certainly seems like you could pack a theater with that with children. Uh, I have grandchildren, and I've seen them all 12 times. Well, I think it's it's a really, and I mean, the panelists all have a lot of great things to say about this, so I'll just be brief, but it's important to look at the different types of animation. So is it a, um, so is it a, is it on TV, and what time of the day would it be on TV? Um, is, it, is it a full-length feature film that's being theatrically distributed? Then those film those fall within the quota unless they're um, under one of the, un, unless they're one of the other uh, production services agreement or um, a or a, a, uh, my, my, uh, the films that are just sold wholesale to Chinese distributors. Now, um, if we look at film, if we look at films that are being distributed online, then that's another that's another type of um, regulation and, and oversight. So, but it's but it's actually much more controversial than than you might imagine. There was actually pushback from the PLA over um, the individualism in Zootopia. And actually, the animation the animation market is huge in China, and the Chinese film industry is really actively cultivating its own animation uh, films. And it I scored a huge success a couple of years ago with. Uh, uh, now I don't remember the name of it. It's, 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 it's about monkey hero or right? No monkey. The monkey, king, monkey god, monkey king, monkey. Monkey uh, king, yes, monkey, monkey king. king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a. And actually, just on the flip side of that, because um, we looked at this issue last year and it continues to be very interesting. There's a lot of Chinese investment going into high quality animation in the U.S. And there are some people who think that China's big global breakthrough movie might be an animated movie. Yeah. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I think that's one area where there's a lot of interest on, on both sides in creating. Thank you. Hi, um, Ying, um, ma'am. When you first started, you said um, that China was interested in cultural influence by making these movies. Then later on, and I'm very fascinated, then you said that the Chinese audience doesn't want uh, a combination product. They want either a Chinese product or an American product. So my question is, isn't America also influencing China by Chinese taking the American product? And what is the Chinese goal for cultural, uh, wh what is their plan that you see for cultural influence on us? Right, let me, so essentially two questions. Let me take the, the first question. Uh, thanks. Um, um, how was the first question is the... <laughs> what, what did, what does China hope to, in, how does it, in, you said they wanted cultural uh, actually, influence right. in America. So I think that's actually the second, the, sub, the first part is, uh, so what has China gained from Hollywood? I, I have to be honest, no. you know, Chinese cinema, when Hollywood from day one. So Chinese film industry from its inception pretty much emulated Hollywood style, institutional structuring, narrative yeah. style. I mean, it's, you know, they pretty much followed the Hollywood playbook until uh, the founding of China's people, uh, Chinese People's Republic, uh, People's Republic of China, right? And, and American films were, were cut off the market and China started to adopt a planned economy, right? They pretty much follow the Soviet style planned economy. You have uh, targeting uh, a quota for each studio. You, you know, this studio, one year you make 10 films, the other, uh, you know, studio make 20 films. Uh, but uh, as soon as uh, Hollywood was, was allowed to come back, boom, you know, a Chinese, uh, a film industry basically very quickly jumped back to the same pattern. So there's really no difference in terms of how they make films, except for the content itself. That there's a huge difference there. Projecting cultural influence. influence. Yeah. Uh, it has a long way to go, is, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. Uh, and so China, you know, let's don't confuse. Yes, the market is really hot. The investment rush in China is hot too. But let's don't confuse Chinese film market with Chinese cinema. They're two different things. I, you know, I just wanted to kind of point out here. So that tells you a lot about where the influence is, right? It's much, it, pretty it, much the hard power is it, instead of soft but power. Is it, yeah. is it a cultural thing? Is it a political thing? Is it, you know? I, I, I think in the, in the past, maybe three, four, five years ago, it was popular to say, let's export China, right? And you have business companies, you know, waving the flag and say, let's bring China out soft power. 
And then there was this mad dash of, okay, how do we do that? Let's go and start buying up Western companies, and we'll use these companies to then get the word out about China. But I think that kind of backfired in the past couple of years because, and again, I'm just speculating here, but I think, you know, the the government, uh, at least parts of the government, saw that and said, we we're, we look like we're now thre threatening to a lot of these foreign medias, or at least we're being portrayed that way. Let's pull back because, you know. The last thing we want is to be appear, appear to have the appearance of a threat. Yeah. Well, and I think it's it's also probably clear that the two main motivations of most of the filmmakers is either something artistic or something financial, right? I mean, they're commercial, and they're not an extension of uh, of the foreign ministry necessarily. Let's keep going because we have a few more minutes, but I want to get as many in as possible. Um, the Chinese market is, is certainly big enough to uh, recoup uh, from the domestic market for most movies. And you know, you mentioned Wolf Warrior 2, you had Monster Hunt, Mermaid, and so forth. There's always a big blockbuster, but they don't travel internationally. So my question is, um, what China, I think, is really looking for in Hollywood is access to IP and access to international English language distribution, because that's really the only way they can uh, go beyond the domestic films, which so far haven't traveled. And then, just as an aside, I wonder if you could make a couple of comments on uh, the India-China relationship, uh, since a lot of Indian movies like Dangal have performed well in China. Will there be more cooperation there? Um, I think that this this question of the India-China relationship is is really interesting because it, like the U.S.-China relationship, also occurs at the backdrop of you know a period of of tension between between the two countries. So, as um, as Chinese President Xi Jinping told uh, Naran, uh, President Narendra Modi that he loved the film Dangal and that it had an extended run in China, there was also you know increased conflict between the uh, border conflict between the two countries at the at the same time. Um, so on one hand, we do see a couple of we do see a couple of shining stars in terms of successful box office distribution of Indian films within China, um, and by the same token, in many ways, it's similar to the the big blockbusters that you were mentioning. There are you know maybe one or two per year that we see that have a great amount of success um, in Ch Indian films that have a great amount of success in the Chinese market, but it's it's far from being a, a very broad um, broad success at this point. And uh, my classmates. Uh, who some Indian classmates who are at the Film Academy actually tried to get work as actors in China, and there's still there's still challenges with colorism um, and representation of you know of uh, different races in Chinese film as well. Can I just and I just like to note that um, that there's a lot going on between China and other Asian countries in terms of collaboration, not just India, but, you know, I mean, we focus on Hollywood and China, but the truth is China is discovering lots of opportunities and other countries are discovering lots of opportunities, other Asian countries in particular, are discovering lots of opportunities in China. Did you? Yeah, I was just gonna add one. One of the reasons why Hollywood films travel around the world is Hollywood American Studios, about 60, 70 years ago, decided that we need to self-distribute. Because when we don't self-distribute internationally, we don't know how much money they're making. So when, when American companies went to the UK and opened their own distribution company and started distributing their films themselves, where they made money or they lost money, they had the data to help them make decisions in casting and storytelling and making films that travel. And then they went to Australia, and then went to Germany. It was slowly, by expanding internationally this way, tweaking with the model, figuring out what movies travel. That's how Hollywood developed what it is. Chinese filmmakers or Italian filmmakers, they don't have all that data for films that work. They only go to film markets and they sell those rights. And whatever they get those MG, that's all they get. They never get any upside. And when the distributors don't make money, they don't sell the sequel to those movies anymore. I've been told to stop, but in fairness to this side of the room, I, I saw some hands that I didn't call on. So last question, sorry. Can you draw some parallels to the gaming industry? Is the gaming industry as heavily regulated like the uh, movie industry? And second, is gaming bigger than the movie industry in China? Oh, I, I'm not an expert on this, so maybe, but, I, but my impression is, haven't done any real extensive research, my impression is gaming is a huge, huge market. I'm not sure, at, you know, at the current state of whether it's a, a, you know surpassed the film uh, market, but the potential is huge. 
So just looking at foreign investment within, within the gaming industry, if that's, um, I think that there are some really interesting strategic challenges that the gaming industry actually shares with a broad range of digital, of digital platforms uh, for entertainment. And one of those is China's um, 2017 cybersecurity law, so requiring data localization. So um, foreign companies that, are, that have servers um, have to have a majority um, partner who are uh, China, a majority Chinese partners. So we already saw that with Apple's um, Apple developing a new cloud uh, cloud uh, cloud server in or cloud computing uh, center in Guizhou Province. Now, um, because because of the increased regulation of um, the internet as well, we see um, in February this coming February there's the likelihood of a, a VPN crackdown. So um, so that means that the that Games would have to be hosted domestically. Um, so the digital distribution of any form poses a wide variety of different strategic risks. Right. Well, thank you. I'm, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm sorry to leave you wanting more, but I also feel like, well, maybe that works to my advantage. I, uh, we're, you know, the Asia Society U.S.-China Film Summit is on, no, on November 1st. There are flyers on most of the tables, and I encourage you to look into it, and we're going to talk about these issues and do it all day. So I'd just like to thank Ying, David, and Anne uh, for your really great comments. Thank you so much. Thank you.